connect where we're going here and try to uh, help make sense of what we're talking about. You know, this far, thus far in this series, we've talked about faith that will attempt the impossible with the Apostle Peter, right? Remember, that was the first week when he got out of the boat. And we talked about faith that believes that God wants to use us to do great things. We talked about David. Remember, everybody got a combat Carl after the service as a reminder that, hey, God wants me and God can use little old me. And then we talked about faith that presses through when things don't go as planned. And we talked about Paul and Silas, right, how they were, they weren't expecting when they had a vision to go to Macedonia, they thought that was going to be the most awesome outreach they've ever done, and they ended up having the tar beat out of them uh, sitting in a prison cell. Not a good day, right? And then we talked about faith that overcomes my past, right, with the woman who anointed Jesus' uh, feet with her tears. That was powerful. Faith to triumph in a backslidden culture when I don't even feel worthy myself by a man named Gideon. <laughs> then we talked about faith to believe God. And we said believing in God is vastly different than believing God. A lot of people say they believe in God. They're, they're, that, that, that's, that's like rudimentary. We're called to believe God, right? All these messages are available online on our podcast, YouTube channel. If you want to go back and catch them, please do. Or just turn them loudly in your home and they'll scare flies away, all right? And then last week we talked about defiant faith and the kind of faith that's not going to take what everyone else gets. And I'm not going to sit here, I'll stand in line and take what's handing out. But there is a level of defiant faith where the man named Jacob, right, he wrestled with the angel. He wrestled with that mysterious figure and said, I won't let go until you bless me. There is a defiance in faith that causes breakthrough. Hello, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said, you can throw us in the fire if you want to, but we're still not going to bow down. That's a defiant faith that God is calling his people to today. So today, I want to conclude this series, and I want to examine what is likely the greatest faith of all. I think the greatest, and I, I just believe this, studying this this week, the greatest type of faith is the faith that we will see illustrated from the saints we're about to read about in Revelation. Faith that finishes strong. It's one thing to have faith right now, but faith that finishes strong is ten times more powerful. I'm doing good today. How will I be doing in 20 years? That matters. Faith that will get across the finish line. And I want us to read this together. We're going to jump here uh, in a couple of passages. And I apologize in advance for that, but we're going to start in Revelation 7. Are you all there? I'm going to try to give you just a little teaching on Revelation 7. I'm not going to, I'm going to avoid giving you a, a brain uh, dump today, a, a brain download or whatever. Thank, thank you, say thank you and amen for that. We're not, going to, we're not going to talk about everything we know about Revelation today. But I want to make it clear that there's some things that we've misunderstood in the book of Revelation. Let's start. Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. How many there say, oh yeah. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so no wind could blow on the earth, on the sea, or in any tree. And then I saw another angel ascending from the east who had the seal of the living God. And he shouted out with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given permission to damage the earth and the sea. Do not damage the earth or the sea or the trees until I put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Now I heard the number of those that were marked with the seal, 144,000 sealed from all the tribes of the people of Israel. Let's skip down to verse 9. After these things I looked, and here was an enormous crowd that no one would count, made up of persons from every tribe, people, language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, dressed in long white robes with the palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God. Here's the thing. People say, well, who's the 144,000 or who's the great multitude? I just want to tell you, that. let me just solve that for you. It's one and the same. It's one and the same. You say, well, how could that be? Because the 144,000 represents uh, the, the purified uh, uh, number. It's, there's a preciseness to it, right? There's 12,000 per tribe of Israel. And we know without, again, diving too deep, that the ten, first 10 tribes of Israel were completely wiped out and, and diluted back, back in the, you know, 586 B.C. And then Judah and Benjamin later in A.D. 70. So we could get into all that. But I think that the thing we need to remember with the book of Revelation is God. 
God is giving us a lot of powerful symbolism. It's okay if you want to take some things literally, but here's the law of hermeneutics or studying your Bible. You can't take some verses literally and then go two verses later and say that's symbolic, all right? We can't do that. I see people do that all the time. So it's best just to enter Revelation understanding that there's some symbolic stuff there, right? And we say, well, how can we be both 144,000 and the great multitude? It's real easy. How can Jesus be a lion and the lamb? In the very same passage, I heard a lion, and I looked, and I saw a lamb. How could that be? Right? Here we say, I heard 144,000, and I looked, and I saw a great multitude. Are you tracking with me this morning? And they were worshiping. Verse 13, then one of the elders asked me, these dressed in long white robes, who are they, and where have they come from? And I said to him, my Lord, you know the answer. Then he said to me, These are the ones who have come out of great tribulation. Are you with me? They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God, and they serve Him day and night in His temple. And the ones seated on the throne will shelter them. They will never go hungry or be thirsty again. And the sun will not beat down on them, nor any burning heat, because the Lamb is in the middle of the throne. He will shepherd them and lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eye. You notice sometimes we like to quote that verse. Oh, in heaven, God's going to wipe every tear from your eye. But the second you say, oh, wait, but they went through a tribulation. Oh, that can't be us then. One and the same, friends. One and the same. Let's jump here in the Bible, not literally. Revelation 14. A little fast forward here. All right. Are you there? Sorry, I just read a little extra scripture today because I want, I want everyone to, to see this, this background, all right? Then I looked, and here was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion. And with him were 144,000 who had his name of his and his father's name written on their foreheads. I also heard a sound coming out of heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of thunder. Now the sound I heard was that made by harpists playing their harps. I want to tell you right now, that's a lot of people playing harp right there. That's a lot of harpist harping, right? It sounded like thunder. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one is able to learn the song. Oh, this is so good. Except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. You, 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 it, can you figure out why they know the song and no one else does? Because they had been forgiven from sin. The Bible tells us the greatest song of all is the song of the redeemed. Right? We have salva- We have the thing that angels have desired to look into, but they, they can't. Right? Because they don't know what it's like to be fallen. They don't know what it likes, it's like to be an old drunk out in the, on the street. They don't know what it's like to be addicted to something and be set free and have the blood of Jesus wash you and cleanse you. This is why this multitude, this 144,000 specifically here, they were able to learn the words that no one else was because they had walked through some stuff that no one else had. God had purified them. And they were the ones, verse 4, they had not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. Again, just symbolically, they're pure before the Lord. These are the ones who will follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were redeemed from humanity as first fruits to God, to the Lamb, and no lie was found in their lips. They are blameless. Okay, then watch this. The angels begin to release these proclamations of judgment. Then I saw verse 6, an angel flying directly overhead, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those that live on the earth, every tribe, nation, language, and people. He declared in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has arrived. Verse 8, a second angel followed that. Fallen, fallen is the Babylon, the great city. She made all the nations drink with her wine of her moral passion. Verse 9, a third angel followed the first two, declaring in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image, or takes the mark on his forehead or her hand, that person will also drink of the wine of God's anger. Verse 13. Or verse 11, rather. Lost my place. There. 
And the smoke from their torture will go up forever and ever. And those that worship the beast in his image will have no rest day or night, along with anyone who receives the mark of his name. Anyone who bows their knee to Satan in any culture, in any time, at any point in history, those who reject Jesus Christ, this is who John is talking about. Right, we, we, we look at this as some sort of magical thing, that, but it's, it's what is being written here is true for all times. Anyone who rejects Jesus Christ and worships money, worships fame, worships their family, worships material things, worships anything but Jesus Christ, you're worshiping an antichrist. See, the greatest question is not who the antichrist is, it, it's the antichrist spirit that's already present, it's with us. See, in my lifetime, I've heard some really stupid things. I've heard people say, well, Ronald Reagan, <laughs> this is going back a few years, right? Uh, Ronald Reagan is the Antichrist. Uh, then I heard it was Bill Clinton, and then I heard most recently it was Barack Obama, right? So we have three stupid ideas from people that try to put forth, and I'll just get a spoiler alert. If somebody tries to tell you America is mentioned in the book of Revelation, they're trying to sell you a book or a videotape. We're not in there. Here's another rule for studying Revelation. If it didn't make sense to the people that received it originally, then it probably is wrong to interpretation, right? We were almost a couple thousand years from America coming into existence here. Okay, verse 12. The referent is back to those who purified themselves. Verse 12. This requires the steadfast endurance of the saints those who obey God's commands and hold fast to their faith in Jesus Christ. That's a verse you can highlight, tap it with your thumb, hit yellow, hit purple. If you got a paper Bible, underline it, write it. This is what's going to happen. If we are going to have faith that finishes strong, if are you with me today? If we are going to be people that overcome, here is what the angel is saying. Here is what those had that were purified before the Lord. They were faithful to the Lord. They knew God's word and his command, and they were faithful to the end to Jesus Christ they stuck with the faithfulness of Jesus to the very end and I want to just point this to you because this is so important that we understand to finish strong that we understand the kind of faith it takes to do so you may be seated Lord Jesus thank you for the power of your word God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and change our lives today. God, I pray that we would receive from on high in the name of Jesus. God, I pray nothing would distract us today. I pray, Lord Jesus, that nothing would detour us. I pray, God, that nothing would keep us from your truth. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So the theme of the book of Revelation is quite simple. Are you ready? Here it is. Here, you want Revelation summed up in one sentence? There is a price to pay to follow Jesus, and we must stand strong and endure to the end if we are to overcome. There is the whole theme of Revelation. There will be many antichrists to come. There will be many antichrist spirit. Jesus even said the spirit of antichrist is already with us. We read that in the New Testament. The point is, we're not looking necessarily for a specific person, even though there will be a specific person at some point in the future. The reality is the spirit of antichrist is already in operation today and many are falling prey to that spirit so while we're worried about identifying a man foolishly at this point and identifying this and that we need to get back to the general theme of revelation that listen that spirit is already present and god's people hear me we have to purify ourselves from the world we have to keep ourselves strong in faith and we have to do whatever it takes to make it There's revelation for you in a couple paragraphs. That's it. That's why it's a blessing for studying the book, as the Bible says. It's a blessing for studying it. We talk about being the church of Acts, and I get that in the early church, and, and, and using Acts as a blueprint, and I, I think that's great. But I really think the book of Revelation is where we need to put our focus. I think the church of Revelation is where we're really at today. And depending where you live on, that pl on this planet, your amen would be louder than some other folks in here. If you were a Christian in China or Pakistan 
or certain parts of India or Myanmar or we go down the list, uh, you know, certain countries and certain nations in Africa, you would say, absolutely, we are at, we absolutely understand withstanding persecution and instand, withstanding what the enemy is coming against us with. Here in America, it hasn't happened fully and totally yet, but we'll be there. Right now, it's very insidious. It's very intellectual. It's an undermining of the truth. This whole transgender thing is, is exactly that. It's undermining truth. Undermining truth. Undermining truth. There, there was, a, I forget the guy's name, but he was a famous atheist. But he said this, if they can get you to believe the absurd, they can get you to do anything. Hello, we're there. They want us to believe the absurd. They want us to believe the ridiculous. They want us to go along with it. And the whole reason is there is a demonic plan. Maybe no human understands that plan yet. I don't know if there's any organized plan to try. But it's a demonic thing, right? It's that spirit of Antichrist that we're talking about that is ultimately trying to shift everything against Jesus Christ. The day will come when hate speech is simply talking about Jesus with people. If you don't think that's coming, you're foolish. Because I believe we are seeing literally last day events unfold today. And Jesus is preparing his bride, a pure spotless bride. Not just metaphorically, but really pure, pure in reality, a bride who is longing for his return, a bride that will die for her groom. I want us to see the faith in the saints of Revelation and the saints that, that the faith that they had, and I want to know the level of that faith and I, that I can finish strong. I, I, I had a, a coach tell me one time, the two most important things you can do in life is start and finish, but the most important thing is finish. Every person who names the name of Jesus Christ, your servant God today, I salute you. I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for those of you that have yet to fully surrender. I encourage you to do that today. But I want to tell you, the greatest thing once you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you're following him is make sure, by golly, that you finish strong. Revelation 14, 12, it says this requires the steadfast endurance of the saints. You were able to look back and find it quickly because you'd already highlighted it because you're awesome like that. This requires a steadfast endurance of the saints, those who obey God's commandments and hold to their faith in Jesus Christ. In this series, we've used the word rarefied faith because it's kind of faith that we've talked about seems rare sometimes. It seems like it's in a rare supply. So we're going to buck the trend, right? We're going to make rarefied faith normal. We're going to bring rarefied faith back. There you go. Here's how we do it. Here's this three, the three things I see here in Revelation 14, 12. That's our text, Revelation 14, 12. Number one, if you're ready, rarefied faith will persevere no matter what. The first line in verse 12, it will require steadfast endurance. These saints in Revelation were pure. There was The Bible says there was no deceit on their lip. The angel said this is required for steadfast endurance. Another word for that, steady perseverance. John tells us that they refused to worship the beast. They refused to follow the world system. Hello, anybody out here today? The gods of this world, they refuse to bow to antichrist policies that reject Jesus. They stood strong like a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the face of evil and said, we're not going to bow. We're not going to bend. Well, no matter what you tell us, we are going to honor Jesus Christ in all we do and say. They were patient in the midst of trial. They didn't sell out to find relief. They didn't change theology to make life easier to deal with. They stayed true to Jesus. Again, this is the theme of Revelation. I'm just talking scripture here right now. If you want to get Jesus off the flannel board, like we often say, and into real life, this is it right here. 
It's I will serve Jesus no matter how politically incorrect it is, no matter how unpopular it is, no matter how people hate me, no matter what people think of me, no matter what family member says. Some of you have people in your family that are very anti-Christ, and you, you have that conflict all the time, and we, we're praying with you for your families. But I want to tell you, there is this something powerful about people that will stand and not sell out, not give in. So the question is asked, how will I stay true to Jesus when it's all on the line? You ever ask that when you were a kid? You ever hear stories about persecution and people died for their faith and maybe you were like me? I would sit there and say, man, I wonder what I would do in that moment. Anyone ever had that thought? Nobody. Okay, well, me and, okay, three, four, five. I'm literally counting right now. Oh, okay. What would I do? You read a story of great faith in God and it cost somebody's life, and you say, man, what if that was me? What if that was my head they had the gun to? What would I do? How will I stay true to Jesus when it's all on the line? Can I tell you, that's the easiest answer ever. You ready? How are you staying true to him now? Remember, if you're faithful in the few, few will it be the master over many? If you're faithful with the few things that God has put in your charge, the little temptations you're able to overcome, the little decisions when no one's looking, the, the little things that, that, that no one sees, no one, no, no one knows what you're doing, but in those moments you're making right decisions and they seem like such small things at the time and they seem like such tiny things, but the reality is you are preparing yourself for the bigger things later. The relationships you value, my friends, are the ones you protect. So the question is, how are you protecting your relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you honoring him in all you do? Are you honoring truth? Are you honoring purity, right? If you can't honor purity now, you sure won't do it when there's a gun to your head or there's an ax to your throat saying you're going to accept Jesus or not. Are you going to reject Jesus or not, right? If we can't make those little decisions now, forget the bigger ones later. Are you honoring God's word? Or do you try to find loopholes or, or use grace as an excuse for a lack of obedience? This is the new thing in America. It's not really new. It's been around for about 10, 15 years. But, you know, let's use grace. Let's say, oh, nobody's perfect. We're all trying. We're all on a journey. All those things that we use to do what? Excuse the fact that we refuse to get pure before the Lord. Jesus tells us that parable in Matthew 25, verse 23. Be faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many. Therefore, enter the joy of your Lord. I want to tell you there's joy to be had from the kingdom of heaven when we make decisions to do right and to serve the Lord and what we consider the small things. Those small things in your life, those little decisions to be honest, those little decisions that you get too much change, you give it back. That may seem little, insig- that's big. Because what you're doing, you're being faithful in the few, and you're working your way up to the point where when the big stuff comes, it'll be an easy decision to make at that point. The se- second component of this faith that finishes strong that we see in Revelation 14 was that w- we see in the second part here of of. Revelation 14, 12, rarefied faith knows and obeys God's word. Because the angel said, right, th- this is the second part of this, those who obey God's commands. Why are those being purified? Why are they untouched? Are, is anybody out here today? Why, why is the tears being wiped from their eyes, right? Why, why are, are the sun not allowed to beat down on them anymore, right? You can read all that in there again if you want when you go home. Why is all this good stuff for, happening for them now? Because the reason is they obeyed God's commands. So it should never come as a surprise when people are doing well in the Lord, is it? Every person I've talked to who's doing well in Jesus Christ, it's never a surprise. In fact, it's predictable. Let me guess, you're reading the Word every day, yeah? Let me guess, you have a prayer life. I sure do. 
All right. Same uh, on, on the other side of the coin. It's just as predictable as well. I'm struggling. I'm not doing good. Why are you struggling? Well, when's the last time you opened your Bible? Well, it's been a while, Pastor. How about your prayer life? Well, I, I, I pray before my food sometimes when it's not embarrassing. But here's the thing with knowing God's word and obeying God's commandments. You can't keep what you don't take time to know. I know I'm speaking to everyone who reads their Bible for two hours a day today. But let me just give you an update on the rest of Christianity this morning. May I? 75% of American Christians, according to the Ponce Foundation, do not believe the Bible is even the word of God. And we wonder why America has problems. Only 22% of them believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. It's probably the same 22% that actually bothers to attend church every Sunday. That's just my statistic. I have no idea. I'm just throwing that out there. It's a pondering. Sometimes I ponder while I preach. You think I've lost my place sometime? I really have, and I'm just pondering on it. True story. They say that 57% of Americans who profess Jesus, they believe that other religions will lead to eternal life. I'd like to tell you today, if you believe there's any other way to heaven except Jesus, you can't. it's impossible to be a Christian because that's to deny Christ why Jesus died. That's why he came. If all other religions were sufficient, but they're not. Only 36% of evangelical Christian churches believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. I know you read stuff like that, and a lot of us may say, wow, how is that possible? Let me help you with that one, too. Because, you see, there's really more than one answer to that. But here's part of the reason. We've traded the cloud for the crowd. You see, when our concern becomes more about seeing how many people we can get in the building instead of how much more God we can get in the building, we've got a problem. Why? Because you will compromise. Whatever your main primary goal is, you will compromise, and you'll sacrifice anything to make that happen, and you'll cover it up with Bible verses and say it's vision. We have production meetings centered on what people will enjoy in church rather than what Mary of Bethany would enjoy or what Jesus would enjoy. We call people to an unbiblical form of rest. While Paul talked about being ready to spend and be spent for the gospel, he said, I labored more than all of you. I've never seen a generation, let me just be honest, I'm with you, I live there. I've never seen a generation that complains about being tired more, but's done less for the kingdom of God. On social media, I've never seen such chronicled lives that done absolutely nothing. We're, we're down to taking pictures of our food and posting it. Every time somebody follows me on Instagram or Twitter or whatever, I try to, I, you know, I like, number one, make sure it's a bot, especially on Twitter or Instagram. I make sure it's legit. So let's go. And so you see pictures, and it's like, okay, if I see someone's supper, breakfast, dinner, I'm like, okay, it's a real person probably. Now, it's nothing wrong with posting your food. I know some of you feel really offended right now. Don't be. It's okay. But I'm just saying, we chronicle a bunch of nothing for the most part on social media. We keep giving altar calls to overcome rejection and condemnation over and over. Meanwhile, terrorists are training disciples of Islam to become martyrs for their faith. They're learning how to die for their faith. They're learning how to die. You know what blows my mind is when 9-11 happened back in 2001, you would think, wow, what a black eye on Islam. Everybody will leave in that faith in droves. Just the opposite happened. When those planes flew into those World Trade Center towers, there was an explosion of growth of Islam in this country.
because the world sees, hmm, somebody's willing to die for their faith. <laughs> Interesting. We preach on the love of God without preaching obedience to him. We call people to their destiny and dreams without any call to live for the fame of Jesus name only. We're quick to call people pastors, evangelists, teachers, apostles and prophets without calling them to repentance to be hidden in a secret place of devotion to Jesus Christ. I'm giving you the reasons why we have 33 percent of Christians that don't really believe that that Jesus is the only way to heaven or that he is the only way to heaven. 67 don't believe that. We release mantles of power and absolutely nothing happens. We'll tell you the latest revelation, tool, concept, idea, process, anything to bring heaven to earth. Anything but bringing people to prayer, fasting, giving, and taking up our cross and following Jesus daily. I'm disturbed that there's currently 17 church planning models that are active in our, in our country today. Not one of them that I know of is biblical. They're all based on franchise models. It's like, oh, well, just like we, 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 uh, we, we got, had great, great success with Chick-fil-A or Taco Bell. That's how we're going to build churches. But none of them, I haven't yet to seen one that takes to Acts chapter 1 and 2. It says, here's the plan. We're going to walk our backsides up into a prayer room, and we're going to stay there for 10 days or however long it takes until the power of God falls on us, until we have a flame on our head, and then we're going to go out and we're going to change this culture. We're going to lay hands on the sick and see him heal. We're going to raise the dead. We're going to cleanse lepers. We're going to open blinded eyes. It seems to me in some cases that we've handled some of the most important things very carelessly in our lives and resultantly very carelessly in our churches. Are you all with me today? Some of you just sitting there looking at me like you're, I don't know. But I'm speaking the truth to you this morning. We've handled the most important things carelessly. I'm not just saying, I'm just speaking general. I'm talking about the church, uh, uh, the contemporary church in America. My dad passed away in 2015. A lot of you knew who my dad was, knew my dad. Shortly before my dad passed away, he had written this long-form letter to me. If you knew my dad, he's got this, uh, had this amazing handwriting. He looked like John Hancock. He looked like, my dad looked like he was the signer on the Declaration of Independence. That was his, that was his signature. That's how he wrote. After he passed away, I would remembered, I was reminded that there was this letter that he had given me, and I remembered. I remember reading it. It came along with a, with a plaque that he had given me, and the plaque hangs in my office. It means a lot to me. I see it every day. But after my dad was gone, I was like, you know, I'd really like, I'd really like to read that letter. I want to go over that letter again and see and read it in my dad's own handwriting. And I went back to my house and I looked at all the important places that I thought I would have had it, and I couldn't find it. I went to the basement and I began to look in some boxes, and I went everywhere I thought, and I. Was just flummoxed and I said where would I have put that letter and I remember the day I was sitting in my basement and I just wept I just wept and I said these words to myself how could I have handled something so important so carelessly but I want to tell you what is even way more tragic than that, my friend, that we handle this precious faith that we have in Jesus Christ so carelessly, that we're allowed mixture from the world in, that we allow others to come in and change our minds and change the, the meaning of the gospel and change uh, the, the, what, what God has done in our life. We allow mixture, we allow junk of the world to come in, and we allow it to affect us because we are handling, careful, listen, we are handling something so precious and so valuable so carelessly, I would encourage you not to do that. Because you see, there's no shortcut in this thing, my friends. Remember the message of Revelation, you have to endure to the end. 
Uh, let me just off the top of my head. He endures to the end shall be saved. Jesus said that. Revelation, see to it that no man takes your crown. That's in the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation, oh, from the heights that you've fallen, return to your first love, repent of your sin, and do the first works you did when you first fell in love with Jesus. That's the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, if you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. Jesus said that. Post-cross, post-resurrection, grace age, right? Holy Spirit's already come. Jesus already come out of the tomb, right? He said, if you are lukewarm, you will be spewn out of the mouth of God. That's the Bible. See that theme? Don't let go of it. Know the word of God. Because, listen, there's no shortcut in this thing. There's only the long path. This is what Jesus said, right? And this is what we got to remember in churches today, right? We're trying to convince people to walk the hard path. We may try to look at nice and friendly. We may try to make it look easy. But really, in reality, this is the hard path. Jesus said in Matthew, enter through the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is spacious that leads to destruction and there will be many who enter through it. But look at verse 14. But the gate is narrow and the way is difficult that leads to life and there are few who find it. Few will find it. Hard to reconcile that verse with some other stuff that you hear today. We get to Matthew 7. Jesus said people will say, Lord, but I cast out devils. I gave in the offering. I said a prayer. I have baptism waters dripping off of my hair still. I have a communion wafer still melting on my tongue. He will say, depart from me. I never knew you. You see, Jesus didn't wait till people were three or four steps in before he unleashed the (laughs) the, the truth. That was the first step in following Jesus. Die to yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. I close with this. Finally, we see a rarefied faith stays faithful to Jesus Christ until the very end. And that was the last part of verse 12, Revelation 14, 12. And they hold to their faith in Jesus Christ. And we read it here. It's not just in what you say. It's not just in a verbal claim. It's something tangible we hold on to. It's how we act. It's how we move. It's how we breathe. Serving Christ is who we are. It's just not something we claim. It's not just a church we attend. Are you out here today? It is, it's the very essence of who we are. Why? Because if we are in Christ, Christ is in us. There is something new. There is something powerful and living. His name is Jesus inside of us by his Holy Spirit. You see, I've discovered that it took me some time in life, but we have to live from a God consciousness that comes from within, not from without. Galatians 2.20, it says, but I'm crucified with Christ, therefore it's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me, and the life I now live, I live because of the faithfulness in Jesus Christ. So it's literally, it's like you are dead, but you're not really dead. You're alive, but you're not you. It's something else. It's someone else inside. It's confusing. It sounds like some weird apocalyptic movie, but the reality is it's the power of Jesus, and if you've really come to Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us the old has passed away, the new has come, and that's why we can say serving Christ is who we are. It's not something i got to be talked into. It's not something that I, I have to be you know, beaten over the head. It's, it just generates. It just comes out of the middle of me. There is something powerful alive inside of me see I realized for about the first 16 years of my life I was living with someone else's God consciousness my parents God bless them I was going off of what they said going off their example 
but it wasn't really mine. Right? I grew up in a Pentecostal church. For the, honestly, at the time I attended there, and I'm not trying to throw shade on it now. I'm just being honest for what it was. If you know where it was, great. If you don't, I ain't saying. But I grew up in a Pentecostal church. For the most part, when I attended, it was dead. And especially so as I got into my teen years. If you don't believe me, we literally, this isn't a joke. We literally had a lady die in church, and it took about 15 minutes for anyone to know it. That's how dead it was. But when I was 16, I had an encounter with Christ that changed everything for me. And I was at Turner Falls Youth Camp in Turner Falls, Oklahoma. You can hardly find it on a map. Outdoor tabernacle, Oklahoma heat, hello, no air conditioning out there. Wooden benches, not comfortable padded seats and air conditioned comfort. We sat on wooden benches, friends, in the heat. You get dressed up for church because you had to. And you go out there and you sweat through everything you own. But in that atmosphere, the glory of God came down. That night, we went back to our room in our, our cabin, our dormitory. There's about 10 or 11 guys in our group. And we prayed, and suddenly God came down in our room. That night, I was gloriously baptized in the Holy Spirit. We prayed. No, it, We started at about 11 p.m. I, we prayed all night long. The glory of God filled the room to the point that this is no lie, and it's hard to describe, and you may, may look at me like I have seven heads, but I don't care. We prayed, and, and suddenly we noticed that the sun had come up because there was light coming in from the outside. Everyone in the room was stunned because to a man, to a young man, even the counselor, I, I talked to my counselor a couple years ago, and I, of course, older than me, but still alive, doing good. I said, you know, did, did I, am I remembering that right? We prayed all night in the Spirit, and the glory of God came down, and it was like seven hours, but it seemed like 15 minutes. He goes, oh, no, that's exactly what happened. Every one of us were stunned. We thought, man, we've only been praying a few minutes, but we had prayed all night. And that's where the worm turned for me, so to speak. From that point in my life, you see, I then lived with an acute God awareness that was inside of me. I no longer lived on someone else's experience. I no longer had to rely on others' God consciousness. And I want to tell you, the time or two in my life when my faith began to waver, Right? We all hear the statistic about when kids go to sec but church kids go to secular campuses, right? 85% of them uh, uh, backslide. Uh, most of that 85% never returns. It, that, that's not difficult to understand. It's not hard. Because our kids can be all, we could be all around it, but it's got to get in us. We love our kids, but we can't put it in them. We can, own, just like pastors, we, we can't put it in people. We can, we can facilitate it. We can facilitate them meeting God, the Holy Spirit getting in them, the power, the glory. Get, we, can, we can provide opportunities. But at the end of the day, it's up to you and me. And I want to tell you, those are couple, there were a couple moments in my life where my faith wavered, but you know what haunted me? You know what wouldn't let go of me? That moment, Turner Falls Camp in that dorm room where we prayed all night, I knew that was real. I knew God had met me. And that, my friend, that God consciousness inside of me has never left me. That kept me dialed in. That kept me understanding that there is nothing in this world worth having over Jesus Christ. That's why I'm saying, if you want to be somebody who stays faithful to the end in Jesus Christ, you got to make sure that you have genuine encounters with God. You want to have genuine moments. Because I want to tell you, it's important because Jesus tells this other parable that illustrates this truth. He said in the parable of the vineyard, the Bible says that one worker said, I will go, Jesus, and then he didn't go. 
And then another worker refused to go, said, I'm not doing it. But later he changed his mind and went. You see, this is the, to me the picture of the church. A lot of people sound compliant. Yeah, we'll do it. Yeah, we'll serve you. Yeah, yeah. But the reality is they go off Monday, Tuesday, Friday night, Saturday night, and they're not serving the Lord. The second worker came. Nope. I ain't going. But later he said, I need to get up in there. I need to go. And he went to the vineyard. And Jesus asked the simple question in Matthew 21, 32. Who did the will of the father? The one that said, yes, we'll do it, Jesus. But really didn't. Or the one that says, no way, take a hike. But later felt convicted and said, I'm going. And, of course, the correct answer is the one that later said, I will do it. And this is why Jesus wraps up this parable with this right here. He's talking to religious people. This is what Jesus said. This is why the tax collectors and prostitutes will enter the kingdom of heaven ahead of religious fakes. It's not that they're more favored or more loved. He says, we can sit and rest on our laurels and our good works and all the things that we think make us worthy and forget the fact that it is all about honoring and obeying the Lord Jesus Christ. End of story. Would you stand to your feet with me? Lift your hands to the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 I want to tell you, my friends, something powerful happens when we encounter Jesus that changes us. Even for those that had previously given a no, can now say yes and go for God. <laughs> Come on. There are many who hang around churches today. They hang around Jesus, yet they've never fully committed. They've never fully submitted. But they'd rather play armchair quarterback. They'd rather sit and play armchair critic. Let's question the pastor. Let's question the judgment. Let's question the decisions they make. Let's justify our own sin. We'll change theology as it's convenient for our family or our political views. And then there are the most vile sinners who by their life had said no to Jesus. They've had more addictions. They've had more... Uh, issues in a magazine rack, but they say within their heart, they said, Jesus, we want to surrender all to you. We surrender all to you. <sighs> Jesus, we praise you. Those of you here live in the building today, those of you watching online, I want to call you to do something. I want to call you to fully submit and fully surrender to Jesus Christ. Give all to him. Listen, this isn't a game. This isn't just a religious playground. This isn't just a fun, optional thing. This is life and this is death. The word of the Lord calls us to choose life. Choose life. Jesus came and revealed himself as life. Jesus is light. There is only one way. It is him. If there's any other affections in your life, I want to encourage you to dial in on him, fully submit to him, fully commit to him right now in the name of Jesus. Jesus. If you are here in this place today and you say, Pastor Eric, I need to fully surrender and submit my life to Jesus Christ. I've been a little bit all over the map. I've been a little bit over here and there, and I've been in some stuff I shouldn't have. Look, I, I, I need to surrender it all right now. I need to lay it all down at his feet once and for all. Listen, I'm not saying you're a bad person. I'm not saying you're you're horrible, you're horrific, or you know, I'm just saying you're like me. You're like uh, everyone in here. There is a point that we have to fully surrender to him. Hey, well, I've been coming to church for 20 years. I don't care if you've been coming for 50 years. See, the light of eternity, that stuff is irrelevant. 
If you are here and you need to fully surrender to Christ, I want you to come now. Hurry, hurry, hurry. You need to fully submit, fully surrender. Come on. We're going to lay it all down at his feet today. Come, come, come. Come, come. We're going to fully lay it down at his feet today in the name of Jesus Christ. Faith to finish strong. Faith to get across the finish line. Faith to hear the Lord say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done. Well done. Well done. Church, all of us in here, just lift your hands to the Lord. Come on, the word says, I am not my own. I am bought with a price. Therefore, I'm going to do what? What am I going to do? I'm going to honor God with my body. Come on, lots of scripture talking about how we honor. If we're bought with a price, if Jesus owns us, he owns all of us head to toe. We're going to honor him. We're going to honor him. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, let worship rise in this room right now. Come on. There's people surrendering stuff up here. Come on. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Is there anyone else today 